This is the very first image that came down from CAS A. It was, CAS A was the extended uh, calibration source for the mission. So it was when this first image came down that everyone knew that the observatory was functioning correctly and it would therefore hopefully be a very successful mission. Uh, it was the very first time that the neutron star was seen in the core of CAS A. CAS A has been known for many years because it's an extremely strong radio source also. So uh, when they looked at the spectrum from it, um, the um, if you have a uh, type 2 supernova event, uh, during, the, during the formation of the remnant and the stellar core, uh, the m different elements are produced uh, all the way up to iron before the uh, catastrophic collapse stops any further production of, of nuclei. So the very first ones that are produced are the lower energy ones, oxygen, neon, magnesium, and then you have kind of mid-energetic elements, silicon and sulfur and argon, calcium, and then at the very end, the last things that are produced that are iron and nickel. So this is a typical X-ray spectrum, different than other uh, wavelengths because uh, the emission lines are superimposed upon the thermal radiation emission called uh, Rumstrahlung or breaking radiation. Um, and then the, the emission lines are superimposed on top of that. But one would expect if iron was produced last, that that would be the closest to the center of the remnant. And since oxygen and neon and, and those were produced the first, the earliest, they'd be all towards the outer part of the, of the remnant. But if you colorize, and this is a normal colorization uh, scheme for the Chandra mission, the low energy um, x-rays are colorized red, the medium are green, and the high energy are blue. So if you colorize that, and then you colorize the remnant, you will see that that didn't happen. We have things that are concentrated in one area, but not spread out through the entire remnant, and not concentrated where one would think they should be. Uh, so the normal onion skin effect that one expects with the iron in the center and everything else further and further out toward the edges doesn't work here. Uh, because of the instrumentation on board the spacecraft, unlike other uh, wavelengths, Chandra knows for every single, every single photon that hits the detectors it knows how much energy it has and therefore what element it is. So it can plot a remnant in just one element if it wants to. So if you look, this is all of the elements together. And here, this is a plot of only the silicon. And there's this huge concentration of it over here. There's a blob, a blob, and a blob. But you see that the, the oxygen and neon magnesium it's, it's all through it, mostly towards the out, and then you see these concentrations of iron, but it's not towards the center of the remnant either, where you would expect it to be. So here is another way uh, of looking at the data, and you begin to see, and this little area here was always of great uh, interest, it was called the blowout area. It is pure silicon. Uh, and there's something going on with these bright spots here and here and here. And if you look at a plot of just the silicon, you will see, start to see, the structure that what that really is, that when the event happened, the silicon was actually uh, ejected in, in jets uh, perpendicular to each other. And so you're looking over here, you're seeing one edge of the jet. From our perspective on Earth, you can see one little edge of that jet. The, the, the opposing jet is buried within the remnant itself. It doesn't show up uh, as well because of the orientation. And the other jet is buried within the remnant itself. So this is a one million second observation of the Cassé supernova remnant showing the energies, shows you uh, this, this little blowout area, the, the jet of silicon that's been blown way here to the very edge of the remnant. And this is a composite of the Cas A remnant. The blue is Chandra X-ray, shock wave. The green is Chandra, that's the iron. And the red is from Spitzer, that's infrared. 
and the little bit of yellow and orange stuff, that's Hubble the optical part. And here is a more high resolution um, image of the energy within the Cassay remnant. Uh, this was done by, um, uh, by actually um, a, 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 the, the imaging analysis software. Uh, also, you, you, not, you can learn more information from the data from an object, not just from looking at it again, but also from always getting, making your image analysis software procedures better and better and better. So there is Cas A. So they took all of this data and for the first time ever constructed a 3D walkthrough of the Cas A remnant with all of the elements exactly where they're posi positioned within the remnant. To do this, they used the Harvard Medical Project software because both the astronomical and the medical communities have the same problem. They're looking for patterns in huge amounts of data. In this one, the um, Chandra data is blue, and that's the shock wave. Uh, the iron is also Chandra X-ray data, uh, the green iron, and Spitzer is the red. And the um, orange and yellow, that's a combination of infrared and optical and x-ray data all put together to show those. So, at the center of Cas A is the neutron star. At the very beginning, because of that spatial distribution of the elements, because of that, that distribution, the geometry of where those elements ended up, it was thought that the, the core, the, the neutron star in the center, must be a magnetar to have a really strong, strong magnetic field to cause that distribution of elements. But then, upon further study, uh, another group uh, studied um, this uh, neutron star and discovered that it had a carbon atmosphere. Well, if you have a carbon atmosphere, you have no magnetic field whatsoever. So that took care of the magnetic field. Now it has been determined because the it was no it was um, detected that over a lot of observations that the neutron star is actually slowing down, spinning slower and slower and they have found evidence for the first time ever that of superfluids forming in the core of this neutron star. And for that to happen, that's why it would be slowing down. And so it also, the, the blue, has to be emitting an incredible amount of neutrinos uh, because of the difference in, in energy because of the slower rotation. So we're still not quite sure what it is. This is the Crab Nebula. Now, the Crab Nebula, it is a core collapse of a massive star. It was called a nebula when it was first discovered, but that's, it was misnamed, but we never change anything that we name wrong to begin with. So this nebula is really a supernova remnant, and the blue in the middle is the Crab Pulsar, that's Chandra data. Uh, the red is Spitzer infrared data, and the yellow is what Hubble sees, that's the optical data. So. This is the, uh, a ROSAT image on the left. That's a ROSAT image of the Crab uh, Nebula and Pulsar. And this is the Chandra one beside it. And you can see what a difference in 25 degree increase in resolution does for you, which is why it's always nice to have the next generation observatory coming along for all wavelengths. And as you have noticed, as we've looked at, for instance, you saw in Cas A how different it looks if you're only looking at the optical, or only the x-ray, or only the radio, or only the infrared. And it's sort of, deep sky objects are sort of like people. You know, you can't understand how a human body functions if you only know the skeletal system, or the muscular system, or the lymphatic system. You have to you have to be able to study all of the systems and how they interact with each other and function together to understand how a human being functions as an individual. And that's exactly how it is with deep sky objects. You need to see what's going on in the optical, in the x-ray, in the infrared, and the ultraviolet, and all of the wavelengths because different processes are producing every single one of those different wavelengths. This is a time-lapse 
uh, put together over uh, several months, about seven different observations were put together. You can actually see the surface of the pulsar, and you can see the shock wave moving through the accretion disk of the pulsar, and you can see the particles of matter and antimatter being spewed out along the rotational axis. Here is the crab, uh, along with three other objects, and these are all the result of the uh, image analysis software being enhanced so that it shows features uh, better than it did before, brings out more depth in everything. Uh, here, when you look at the Crab Nebula, uh, you can see these, these cavities here. Uh, actually, this is kind of amazing to me. That's actually the fossilized magnetic field of the progenitor star that was destroyed to f when it collapsed to form the Crab Pulsar. That's pretty cool. So, and this is another pulsar down here. Now, just when you think you know what a type 2 supernova remnant looks like, this is the Vela supernova remnant, all this bubbly mass that is a supernova remnant. And buried deep within all this bubbly stuff right here is the Vela pulsar. Now, the Vela pulsar, if you look at this little time lapse of the Vela pulsar over here, you can see right here, you can watch that jet, the, the southern jet, kind of wobbling back and forth, kind of wiggling back and forth a little bit. This is the first evidence of precession in a pulsar. Now, you're familiar with the precession of the Earth. Uh, the Earth rotates once every 24 hours. Uh, it's tilted on its axis. The, it precesses as it, as it as it spins because it's, it's trying to, the gra difference in the gravitational potential between the, the tilted axis is trying to sort of tilt it up and make it, make it go be straight up and down. It's sort of like a top. When you spin a top and it starts to slow down, it starts to wobble and wobble and wobble. And when it wobbles, the top of that top is pointing at different, different um, areas as, as it goes around. So the Earth has a precession rate as, as the terrestrial pole as sweeps a big circle around the sky, it takes 24,000 years for the Earth. One, 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 that's its processional rate. Well, the processional rate for this little pulsar, which is spinning 11 times every second, is 120 days. Uh, this is also, might be, this is a pulsar with, within its wind-driven uh, nebula. Uh, but this is the remnant up here. This little guy got kicked totally away from the remnant by the whatever mechanism uh, produced that core collapse. So it's out here all by itself traveling between three and five million miles an hour um, and dragging its, you know, pulsar nebula behind it. And this is a jet that it's producing. And this is a very unique jet. It's 37 light years long, which is quite long for a jet for a pulsar but it also has this wiggly corkscrew kind of structure, which is, might be evidence that this also might be a precessing pulsar. Uh, 